Okay. So that's that's one that I've used a long, long time ago. And what does it do? It's a collaborative uh, board system. It, it works with Zoom and works with Teams and that. And I just haven't used it for so long that I can't really describe it, but it's sort of a, a, a whiteboarding type of application. So I mentioned Piazza, which Prezi made me think of Piazza. Piazza is for students to construct wikis on various topics. And it's nice in that, uh, you know, it has a, an easy way for them to enter very readable equations. So it has LaTeX built in there. It's actually a reasonable way for them to learn LaTeX because the code as they use the point and click sort of method is generated for them. And that is now also an app on uh, Microsoft Teams. Though I, I don't use Teams yet. Uh, Tony does, I know. I use uh, Teams in class notebook um, because I'm, I teach lab and I need them to, I use that before we went remote because I found that um, instead of carrying around 20 lab notebooks, I could just have them every day when they leave, leave lab, they scan the pages of their notebook with their phone and upload it to their class notebook and I can quickly look at it without carrying around, uh, you know, 20 pounds worth of notebooks. So I like it uh, pretty well. So one of the things about lab notebooks that um, came up in an earlier uh, virtual coffee hour was that when we ask students to type in OneNote or in whatever, they end up producing a lot less if they're using a tablet and a stylus, they seem to produce as much or even more than with traditional paper. But I thought it was interesting to note that it was the experience of many people that anything that asked them to type, we got back far less than had been previously seen. Well, I mean, even just having on the lab bench, the computer, the laptop is, it's in the way, it's bulky. It's not like a lab notebook, you can fold it in half and just write very quickly. If you have a tablet, you can do that or an iPad, but I, I, that was exactly my experience. And I tried electronic notebooks for one semester and, and, I, and I found it was just a mess. And so I went back to written documents because we, most of my students cannot afford um, tablet or iPad or that. So that's why, you know, one of the things that I'm very interested in knowing is what are the learning objectives and goals of the kinds of writings that you're assigning to the students? Because that would also determine, you know, how long or short it will be, because I don't necessarily will worry about the length if I knew what the purpose of it was. And so in some situations, maybe short is what we want. And in other situations, we want them to be more reflective and want them to write a lot more about a particular thing. And again, you know, it's related to, do we want something about something they've already learned, something that they will be learning, that they have read about in the past, that are, are learned in the past, but we are just asking them for their experiences. So can people share some ideas about what are the contexts in which they have used these things and what they were thinking were their learning objectives and goals for those writing assignments. So Gary Bayer yep. seems to yep. want to speak. I've, uh, I teach high school and I've worked with uh, Kathy Harper at Ohio State on some stuff with just the uh, notebooks like this. We've sort of simplified labs down to a representation of what you have, identify the concepts you're going to need, use your equations and solve them, any math, do that, check. But the one thing we do at the end then is um, what did I learn? What was my original thinking? And how has it changed over the course of this lab? And they can usually get it into two pages, which is nice for a final report when you've got, all, you know, 300 or so, like at the high school, which you can have sometimes. So that gets to be, you know, really kind of complex, but it simplified it down a little bit and they have a pretty good time doing it once they get the hang of it. So, you know, just simple little blocks 
instead of doing all this formal writing, you do more of it into the thinking. Does that make sense? Right. So I'm also interested in knowing, like, you know, what are the prompts that people are giving to the students and how they are framing it in terms of how it's going to help students, because they need to be also, you know, aware of what you are thinking students will get out of it in order to get buy-in from them. So I, I understand, Gary. So that, that was a really nice thing. Thank you so much. One of the historic problems with the undergraduate physics major in writing was that writing had been largely concentrated in the advanced labs, where you're trying to do so many different things that the course became a, a pressure cooker, just completely overburdened with too many goals in one narrow 15 week part of the curriculum. And I think that what a lot of people have done anyway over the years is to unpack what are my goals and how will they be distributed? Um, so we tend to see uh, a very different look to programs than maybe you, you used to. So prompts depend upon context, high school, intro level, modern, and where else you're thinking in your curriculum. But yes, what are you doing? I teach high school and uh, my, over the past few years, I've had a lot more special ed classes or uh, integrated classes or even self-contained classes. And I've seen across the board, my seniors always have trouble um, making connections and drawing conclusions. And of course, with my freshman courses, especially with the special needs students, uh, I always have it extremely straightforward. Like if you look at your data, uh, did this increase, decrease, stay the same? All right, if you look at your hypothesis, what did you say your relationship was? Okay, does your data match your hypothesis? And I'm finding over time, I need to do more of that with my upper level classes uh, and not just my freshman classes because even my seniors may start out a evaluation saying we found one thing and then in their conclusion they'll somehow have talked themselves into the completely opposite perspective and say we found this other thing and I'm like this is not consistent with what you said a paragraph ago. So I'm finding even with my seniors, I need to break it down into those smaller pieces and have them check kind of the step-by-step, -step, okay, what did you find? How does that relate to your hypothesis? And what conclusion can you draw that directly relates back to your hypothesis? So this is a share-a-thon. Someone else want to share? If I, if I may? Yes, please. Um, so I have, in addition to the labs, uh, you know, where it's, of course, the, you know, the writing of the labs, I have two other things that I do, which I did when we were face to face. Um, it was just, they could turn it in online or by hand. And now it's uh, in a form of a discussion. And at the end of every week, uh, it's what have you learned this week? And what were the issues you were having? So um, it's, um, you know, lets them talk a little bit. It doesn't have a particular form. It's only a few points, but they do it. And then I can, you know, adjust for next week if there are things that I need to, you know, go over, people were having issues, etc. cetera. Um, and the second thing that I do um, uh, with the book, you know, engagement with the book uh, as part of homework, uh, it's um, a notebook check every midterm they have to turn in their notes from reading the textbook with annotations. So, so you know, they, they just write out what they have learned. Some people write copious amounts and some people just write the formulas. It doesn't matter. I, but I collect it. And by the second midterm, they're actually writing. The first midterm, pe people miss it, you know. But by the second midterm, they're actually interacting with the textbook and asking questions. And, and then I address those, whatever they have turned in. It's all electronic on Canvas, you know, in form of PDF.
Go ahead. I really like both of those ideas. And um, I, I especially like the framing that Anne provided, how um, because the students aren't in front of us and because they're not next to each other, um, maybe what we need um, as a way to replace some of those like subconscious um, assistance that was being provided or like me being able to go over and troubleshoot is just building in more scaffolds to um, the types of work that students are doing. So instead of, um, you know, instead of write your conclusion, I'm going to ask you a few questions that will take you through the conclusion. And instead of having students, um, you know, work together in some nebulous way, I need to think of how can I sort of build a very particular interaction type that's going to happen between students with very clearly defined roles and activities that the, that the students are going to do that will enable them to, um, to collaborate and send ideas back and forth, um, sort of to replace this, this situation where the two of them are standing next to each other and they can go through things um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a couple of people that have like sort of in-person synchronous communication. Um, and one thing I've been thinking about uh, along this lines is, um, how can we have, in my case, we're working with groups of three students um, synchronously over Zoom, but potentially asynchronously by asking questions to each other. So like, what is a question that I can ask that will prompt these students to talk about the things that I want them to talk about? Um, and then having them share those ideas. And then the thing that I need to submit as a student isn't my own thoughts, but sort of my summary of the thoughts that I heard from the other people that I was talking with. Anyways. Michael, had you wanted to add something? Yes. So this semester, I'm, I'm trying something completely new with an introductory course, uh, an introductory lab. Uh, it's mostly mechanics. And it's a mix of both uh, physics and engineering majors and life science majors. So in the past, we typically do a very um, structured, very guided type of lab here. And I decided this time to try using Tracker, uh, the video tracking software, and give the students a little bit more freedom to basically, here's a goal. This is what you want to measure. Now go work with your group, design an experiment, record it, and collaborate to answer very specific questions, like um, figure out what's the relationship between the, the period and the length of a pendulum, for example. Or we make all these assumptions about projectile motion. Either use my video or videotape your own object and then verify you know, these certain things in your conclusion. Show me <laughs> the data of it. And then I'm trying to give them a little bit more room for creativity to present and so instead of just a formal lab report, I'm giving them the option to also do something like a, um, uh, a Jovi type video if they want to do something a little bit more tech savvy. And it, it's a lot more work for them, but I think that there might be some students that are willing to try something different. And um, I guess try to give them a little bit more freedom to make mistakes and figure out the method. Um, also, I'm trying to make something that's portable in case we are forced out of in-person instruction and they don't have access to the lab anymore. So if they have some flexibility, then maybe they'll be able to, you know, cook up. I don't know. I have these certain objects. I've got these uh, sheet of paper that I can use for a calibration standard and see how that works. I figure it could be fun. It could also completely crash and burn, but I don't know unless I try. So I see Adam has a hand up. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, uh, Michael, uh, fantastic stuff. Um, I'm at University of Central Florida coordinating the introductory labs. And um, uh, sorry, we're getting a crazy storm through here. So my, my mini schnauzer is not wild about the thunder. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be taking a very similar um, similar path, uh, using tracker, allowing for a lot of creativity. Um, you know, uh, uh, describe the, the X and Y motion of a projectile and sort of leave it at that, all right? And, um, um, and using some different, um, different formats for communication, right? So not just the tr traditional lab report, 
but things like uh, like an infographic uh, Microsoft Sway is a new thing that was recommended to me that is a pretty easy one to to use or um, or a poster design and looking at some 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 of the more recent um, you know uh, blogs and guides for for uh, sort of non traditional conference posters. Um, yes, Microsoft Sway S W A Y. Um, I haven't used it much, but a, a Microsoft proponent friend of mine. Um, loves it. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, and we're in the same boat as well, right? That these are starting off face to face, but, you know, on a moment's notice, uh, they, they might go online or at least for some, um, for some sort of messy subset of, of the, of the students that are enrolled, right? Hey, I got a scratchy throat this morning, so I didn't come in. How can I participate remotely? Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, if we crash and burn, we're, we're doing it together, Michael. Thank you. That gives me some uh, confidence. I'm, I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one giving it a go. So there's been a fair bit of discussion about labs. Uh, one of the classic complaints about old school labs, particularly at the intro level, was that students didn't really see much cohesion. They'd have a new topic every week, not related to the previous week, and you go on. With writing, the, the literature on writing instruction and research on, on learning indicates that a lot of the learning comes from revision, from feedback and revision. Uh, that literature is largely not based in physics, but um, it's certainly something to keep in mind. So what do you do uh, to bring students back to what they have been doing? Uh, Gary. At uh, high school, you know, sometimes like I'll have only two classes or maybe three, so I have a little extra time. Those lab books that I showed with that simple format, I will sometimes collect them, stay after late, read them, and then give them back and they get a chance to rewrite because it's only usually two pages. You know, it simplifies it down or it's all in that thinking, but it's amazing by about the fourth or fifth time through, the amount of rewrites almost disappear because they start to get the hang of it of what I need to do. So that's one thing to think about. If you can put a little effort in at the beginning on the rewrites, they seem to not need it so much after four or five weeks. Uh, Wizard. Yeah, or Jake, my name is Jake, can you hear me? Hey Jake, yeah. You got a good beard there, that's a good beard. <laughs> hey, uh, when you're talking about labs and you just I've been responding to what you just said. You start a new topic. I just met, I just mastered that last thing and you dump something new and every week and I'm, uh, I get behind and I get uh, antsy that I can't keep up with the professor. So I've I've I started teaching physics in sixty four at my but my Bible I don't know if you can't see it. Can't see it. Not yet. Uh, I have to turn off my hang on a second. This, this has helped me a lot now, as soon as I figured out how to. Uh, we can see it now. Can you see it now? Well, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm going to shut off my, well, uh, shut off my just, screen share. Maybe just tell us what the book is. It's a dancing, uh, there you go. Uh, the Dancing Wu Li Masters. This was written in 76 by a, a nutcase named uh, Gary Zukov. <laughs> and essentially, he's nuts. But he said, he loved physics, but he says physics professors are the worst humans on the planet because they take a beautiful thing and make it so complicated you can't understand it. And his premise is, is that we shove the mathematics in too soon. That to do a lab or in, in any uh, new topic in physics, you should write a story uh, with no math in it just do a qualitative explanation of what's going on and leave the math out for the first run through and then go back and start putting the math in and it works. Believe me, when I, when I would come across a, a lab or a situation where kids were going, huh, I don't get it. I would make up a story. It could be true or in a fictional thing, just to get, just to give students and they are talking about college students too and not in high school students as well. You know. Here's a story that explains this. Instead of 
you know, excel I would start out the acceleration of uh, gravity and I say, well, uh, how many meters per second squared? What does that mean? I said, no. The old story from, from Zukov's book, uh, the rose petal loves Mother Earth so much, he's, he runs faster as he gets closer, you know. And so he, would, he, would, he came up with a bunch of stories that would simplify in a, in a, in a student's mind what they're doing with the math. Because the math always comes too soon and too fast. And that, that's what helped me anyway. I'm not a hippie, or, you know. I, I I never. I did have love beads, but I never, you know. I I got the beard on. and the hair of a hippie, but no, the, the first they're, they're a hippie. But I'm telling you, if, if physics professors are notoriously bad at putting the math in too soon. The first book I read on on teaching was Arnold Aarons, and that was one of his big points: was that you, you if you start with the math and you haven't motivated it, you're making a huge mistake yeah 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 and that's what i wish you if everybody that i'm speaking with would have uh, uh some great stories that would go along with uh every physics concept you're trying to get across so the math becomes the math becomes a tool instead of this ominous thing that i have to deal with well of course the same thing comes back when i'm looking at the, what the students write well, if the students are writing formal papers for me, which we don't actually do that in every one of our lab classes. We have lab classes throughout the curriculum. Uh, but when they do, they will make the mistake we just described. The, here's the math. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, they get the same advice that, that Arnold was giving long ago. That it needs to be motivated first. So let's see, some of the topics we've been dealing with um, in the chats there, maybe you've got a different one that's on your mind about how you're gonna engage the students, particularly using writing, which might be synchronous or might be asynchronous, but to promote some set of goals you have for your course, what's on your mind? If we are at a lull, then I'm going to give David Sokoloff the chance to do his demonstration. Oh boy. So for that, I'm gonna make you co-host, which okay. gives you the, the ability to share whatever you need to share, if you need to share your screen. Okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll do this very quickly. I, just, I, just, I sent you the link way at the beginning of the chat. So you should have the link if you, uh, let me share my screen. If you, how do I get rid of that? That's good. Okay. If you click that link, this is the page you're going to come to. Um, and you see it has some instructions basically for you, but then it has a list of 16 right now, interactive lecture, demo, uh, home adapted interactive lecture demonstrations. And I'm just going to show you one to show you what it looks like. And let me just say, actually very quickly up front that um, I am not, I don't have access to my lab. I probably, I might have now. I didn't when I started doing this. And so I use the resources that were available to me, some videos of my own, some graphs, simulations and so on. And that's what's incorporated for the students' observations. So I'm gonna show you um, uh, Newton's third law, I hope. And you see, I, so I clicked on it and it goes immediately to a prediction sheet, which is, this is online. Um, and it's exactly a prediction sheet of the type that we use in interactive lecture demonstrations that are in the book, interactive lecture demonstrations. And if I click right up here, I can download a, a copy of that sheet and I'll just open it, but I'm not going to actually use that. There it is. Um, it needs, has a little bit of a formatting problem at the moment, but uh, it, I envisioned that students at home could could fill this in um, using Word, 
And, um, and then uh, if you wanted, they could send it into you because you, we normally collect prediction sheets. So, so there's that sheet, but I'm gonna go back to the, to the online instructions and I, cause I just wanna show you what this looks like. So the first demonstration without going through all the details is a situation where somebody is pushing on a block and the block, you're, they're, the students are told the block accelerates it moves at a constant speed and then it slows down and comes to rest. And they're asked to predict how the two forces would compare to each other. The, um, the force applied by the hand on the block and the force applied by the block back on the hand. And so they make their predictions and then I click, and then it always emphasizes. So I don't know how many times I say this in here. And if you're going to use any of these, I, strongly suggests that you point out to the students that they must make their predictions before they make their observations. And, there, and the reason for that, namely that there's quite a bit of physics education research that shows that when they do that, they actually learn something from these things. And if they don't do that, they won't learn. Okay, so let me click and um, it brings up this video. Uh, and this happens, I happen to have some IO labs. So I use them and you see I'm pushing, speeding up, slowing down, and there are the two graphs. And in this case, we're, we're looking at the, the Newton's third law forces. And so they are, they come out to be equal and opposite as you can see there. But then there are also questions that are asked about, um, what about, why, essentially, why does the thing speed up? What other force is involved here and how do those forces compare? Okay, anyway, so this, these are based on the interactive lecture demonstrations that are in our book. So they basically uh, cover the same things. I'm just gonna show you one other example of this um, and that is a collision. So let me, I'm, I'll skip a few, let's go down to this one. It says a massive cart, like a truck, is given a push so that it moves towards a light car, like a small car, that is at rest. Predict how the force applied by the truck on the car compares to the force applied by the car back on the truck. And um, again, they're asked to make predictions, and then it says only after you make your predictions, click to, uh, to observe the video, and here's the video. Again, using IO labs, and there's the collision. And there are the graphs, and then you can enlarge the graphs, which, oh, that's interesting. I guess I didn't enlarge them in this case. You can, you can broaden the time so that they're more observable. I don't know why that one doesn't do that. But in any case, you can see that the forces are equal and opposite. And then they have to explain what that has to do with Newton's third law. So that's an example of what it looks like, just, just to say that some of them use videos like that, if I had videos. Many of them also use simulations like uh, Fizzlets and FETs um, when they're available. Um, as of last spring, there were about five of these that were posted. I'm gonna go back to that page. Um, and they were all on second semester topics. But now I've just added uh, four in the last week that are on kinematics. Newton's first and second laws, and one on projectile motion, which, by the way, uses video analysis. Um, I can show you that very quickly. Uh, and, and then we're going to go on after this. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, let me just take one second more, and then I'll be done. So there's a just a toss ball. And the graphs are actually plotted out using video analysis, in this case, actually from Logger Pro, but not from Tracker, but the same idea. Okay, I'm done. I just wanted to show you that. They're available, they're, they're obviously free. And if you use them, I'd love to get feedback. They are not research validated, of course. And if you're in a situation where you can use them and research them, that would be great. Thank you. So I, I did want to ask in particular, if we have people who are going to be um, teaching something particularly new 
uh, or who are feeling particularly uncomfortable, I want to invite them to tell us what's on your mind and benefit from the community, community input. Leverage the power of community here. Tell us what's on your mind, particularly people, if, if you're uncomfortable, particularly about anything, not just about the writing components. Everybody here is really comfortable. Okay, Michael. Uh, this is only my second year teaching, so I'm pretty uncomfortable with everything. That's not very helpful for the community, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll bring feedback when it's all said and done. Well, prompt us about anything. What, what? I think not only with the labs, but also with the lectures being, um, well, by force hybrid, at least partially. I already have uh, folks with accommodations that will be not able to be physically present in lectures. Uh, I think I'm nervous about building that community like we talked about earlier and maintaining some student engagement because I'm afraid that what after last spring, the feedback that I got is that people like having asynchronous videos, things that they can do with their own time at their own pace. And here I am trying to keep people on a regular course schedule, whether they're here at St. Vincent or whether they're remote. So I'm nervous about how that's all going to interface. Okay, advice for Michael, which might be advice to yourself, but it's time to give it. <gasps> Run. The first time. Andy, you're going to give advice. I, I don't. Well, I think that we're all in this together. And even if we're all doing this on our own at our own institutions, like I think we're all in a, a variation of the same situation. Um, my department, I'm at a college and my department has um, basically decided that we are going to be 100% um, asynchronous. And <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm in principle, okay with that because um, I think that there are there's potential for synchronous uh, portions to um, raise some, you know, accommodation and equity issues that um, may be less in the asynchronous mode. But you know, uh, being forced into one modality, you know, means I have to think very carefully. And and so, Michael, you have a different modality, um, but. I think that we share the the same challenges of of building community and and um, you know one of the things that I've read recently was uh, and it kind of goes back to what uh, Chandra Leko was saying earlier is, is you know um, thinking about what our objectives are and they don't have to be specific to the course objectives like very very uh, physics related pedagogical but like what do you want your students to get out of that class and form everything that you do around whatever that objective or, or set of objectives is. And so I'm, you know, in the, in the few hours that I have left before classes start next Monday, uh, I'm trying my best to um, focus on, on that. And, and that's, that's really, uh, I think, what I'm trying to do, at least. <clears throat> so I was going to say, to build on what Andrew was saying, I mean, some general things that um, I mean, equity and inclusion issues are so important, especially at this time, but always actually. And so being, you know, flexible with what you're doing. And while synchronous is really important for building that community, if some students cannot do it for whatever reason, be, you know, considerate and make sure you do something that, you know, that with them to make up for all the things that they were not able to do synchronously, right? So recording those things or just like meeting with them. I mean, having these virtual office hours, especially with those students who are otherwise not able to meet with you, giving them some extra time to work through would be a really good thing. Also in general, in your first class, I think that one of the things that you can do that would be really effective is create this inclusive learning environment by talking about resilience and talking about the fact that your goal 
is to make sure that students are thinking and learning new things. And if they were not struggling, if they were not failing, they were not learning anything new. So tell them, you know, if you are struggling, pat yourself on the back. That is a good thing. That's exactly how you get somewhere, right? So say that every time, and then you can even talk about your own resilience, you know, how those kinds of things have helped you in life. You know, like you embrace your challenges and you fail and you get up and you run. And so, you know, creating a good learning environment really requires you to be very upfront with the students and say, don't, you know, worry about not knowing something and just convey it, you know, like talk to other people, you know, I don't know this, you know, like, let's discuss this, you know, why is it this way? And say that that is a good thing, you know, every time you realize that you don't know something, you should be just saying, wow, this is good. I'm on my way to learning something new. And if you say this as an instructor, students are really going to take it in a positive way because they are really looking up to you. And so it will also improve students' sense of belonging and it would improve, you know, like, and it would also inculcate growth mindset in them. Uh, what I mean by that is that intelligence is something that you can grow by working hard and working smart and using deliberate strategies and you know the kinds of things that you are telling them to do, which is working with other students, asking them questions, telling them what your struggles are and what your difficulties are, you know, asking everybody questions and working with each other, as opposed to like just you know being by yourself. And it will also reduce the stereotype threat on the students who are actually minoritized because they are the ones who actually think somehow there is something about them because of which they are struggling, right? And, and the point is that you want to actually bust this myth and say that this is exactly why they are in school. They, you know, struggling is a good thing. We do it all the time and that's how we are learning new things. And so it was too long, but. No, thank you. We all need the cheerleading. So yes, Gary. Great. We appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry, my situation is I'm a, so I'm a physics lecturer and an associate dean in a university in the west of Ireland and an associate dean for education and students. So I, I see what's happening at the moment as, you know, it's, it's troublesome, but it's also a great opportunity because I don't know what it's like in universities in the US, but in Irish universities, lecturers tend to, professors tend to um, focus on content delivery. And especially if you're going to deal with the asynchronous delivery of material, what you need to do is you need to shift your focus to what the student is doing. And I think that's actually useful because you're not doing the learning, the student is doing the learning and all you're doing is facilitating them. So I think maybe a, a refocus from particularly maybe not, but rather than worrying about what's delivered to worrying about what should the student be doing that week to help them gain understanding, I think is useful. So I think there could be some gains out of the, you know, the need to deliver stuff online for another couple of months. Thank you. And um, Adam. Hey, um, yeah, I, I, I love everything that I'm hearing. Um, I'll just add that, that every time I gave students more flexibility, I was wonderfully surprised what they were, what they were able to do. Um, and yeah, that's always a good um, uh, a good side to err on. So, Michael, good luck. I think we're all with you in that. Um, Gabriel, I suspect the lack of folks uh, sharing their uneasiness is like, well, I mean, we all kind of are, right? I mean, it's, it's not nervous. <laughs> I only have three thousand students. I want to try to keep entertained. <laughs> Who's in charge? Gabriel. Yes. What would you like to say? Well, I'll just impose my thoughts. Uh, I used to work on campus, but now I work for National Geographic and Discovery Channel. And my assignment, and I'm sharing this with Michael, so um, two years, huh? And by the way, you can tell how many years these people have taught because your eyes get closer together each year. It's like the rings around a tree. So I just want you, you can tell, oh, 42 years, 18 years, I can tell. Let me count the rings. Right now on the planet, 
there are about 2 million children who have been born in refugee camps and their whole life has been uh, in a camp with nothing. And of course, we want to teach them uh, science, physics, basic physics. And, and so I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, it's the same thing trying to do stuff at home. I was looking at that at home list, you know, I said, well, what if the only thing that you've got at home to learn physics with is a dirty rag, a dead mouse, and, and a, a plastic spoon? So I, at first I felt, oh man, this is going to be a challenge to get, it, there's going to be tons of people that live in these obtuse situations and that keeps growing. And we're going to try to come up with a, a basic physics curriculum for kids who are raised in refugee camps. And I thought that was going to be hard. But you know, what's harder is trying to come up with a physics curriculum for high school kids that live in a media compressed world with, with video games buzzing around their head all the time. It's going to be easier for me to deal with the kids in refugee camps than Michael is with kids who grew up with this blast of media in their head and quick and easy answers all the time, you know. Uh, I'm fighting one battle, but you're you're fighting you're you're fighting a hurry sickness. You know, all the answers come quickly. Everything's easy. You know, everything in my world is fast until I come to your class and you want me to sit down and figure it out. And why would I? I just punch a couple of things on my cell phone and I, I you know. So there you go. Well, we're we're coming up towards the end. Yeah. Um, I guess I have four rules for my students. Uh, the first rule is that you do need to make predictions ahead of time. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can't celebrate. I mean, if you find out your prediction was right, of course you celebrate. If you find out that nature surprised you yet again, you should celebrate the wonder. But you can't do it either way if you haven't made predictions. I tell them that whatever you get, you need to celebrate what you got, but figure out why you got it as best you can. And that usually involves some writing and some head scratching. So writing is this way to really organize your thoughts, both before, during, and after you, you do things. And getting them to slow down. It, it's kind of the second rule. You need to slow down and make writing a central part of your habits of mind and work. And then you're going to do better work. But that's a, a message that requires ongoing cheerleading. But the, the, the final rule, I'm not sure I got up to four yet, was this notion that we, we celebrate the steps along the way. So it, it is about slowing down and, and finding the joy in it, this joy of, of figuring things out. Well, uh, anybody else have last words? Well, one of the things that I was going to say is that I also really like to give assignments to students in which I want them to, I want them to connect physics to their everyday life or to humanity in general, like, you know, arts or something, something else, right? And the kinds of things that students come up with, I mean, are just incredible. I would never think about that. And by the way, writing is actually something that has amazed me, you know, in particular, in the sense that students actually write stories that have physics in them that are absolutely incredible. So I think that, you know, giving students those kinds of things, first of all, really brings out their own creativity, something that I, as an instructor, would never have thought about. And it also gives them an opportunity to connect, you know, whatever they are learning with other things that interest them. So please think about doing those things as well, because students can do a lot of creative things at home. Well, our hour is up. I want to thank you for getting together, and I encourage you to continue getting together, continue leveraging the power of community, continue to reach out when you need things, and when things go wrong, uh, take advantage of the listservs, and uh, we'll get through this together. Thank you, Gabe, for moderating this and thanks to everybody for a great discussion. Thank you.
Look, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank so you. Thanks so much.